So before I read it, uh, this is a this is the concluding parable in this in a set of parables that Jesus is is giving to the disciples as they're questioning, you know, what is eternal life? What will it be like when you come back? Because you've been saying you're gonna you're gonna go away and then you're gonna come back. So what is this going to look like? And Jesus um, gives them a set of parables like he always does, and this is the last parable, really um, before uh, you know things start to go real bad for Jesus, you know. So, um, and again, we, we're at verse, or um, chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 31. It says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another. Just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and, and take you in, or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for one of the, one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not take care of me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or without clothes, or sick, or in prison, and not help you? Then he will answer them, I assure you, Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me either. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Here ends this, the sermon. Let's pray. Just kidding. And so, this is such a, a, a hard scripture lesson um, to, to figure out because... You know, the main concern of the Gospel of Matthew, at least from where we've been going, is righteousness and, and God wanting us to be righteous and what that means. You know, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes or the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? And so he, need, he wants us to be righteous. It's about mercy and it's about loving God. And loving your neighbor. And so, again, the disciples were just questioning all of this, wondering what eternal life will look like. And Jesus lays this parable in front of them. And he's just dropping truth bombs all over. Like, this is, can you imagine just being in the presence of Jesus and him telling you this about how he's going to separate people? He's, and he's giving them this future scene of, of judgment. And again, to go over verse 31 and 33, he says, When a son of man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All of the nations, all of the nations will gather before him, and he will separate them one from another, just like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And this is powerful symbolism here, biblically speaking. You know, if you're on the right hand of God, or on the right side, that is a, a place of honor. I mean, you want to be on 
someone's right side. It's, there's trust and there's strength and there's power in that. You know, when we, a, a, a term that, that, that we throw around is, you know, he's my right hand man my, or my right hand gal, right? And what that means is, you know, I can go to this guy for anything. I can, I trust him. I can lean on him. I go to him for advice. I know that he'll help me when I call him. The right hand man, trustworthy. And so you want to be on the right because the left hand, the left side of God means judgment, means you're foolish. You're cursed into eternal fire, what Jesus says in this, in this scripture. And reading on, starting at verse uh, 34, he says, Then the king will say to those on his right, the good side, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he goes into explaining how he was hungry and, and thirsty and that the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we do this? And Jesus says, whenever you did, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. And then he says the same to the people on his left, but in a, a, a very concerning and condemning way. He says, depart from me because you didn't do these things that the people on the right did. And so he is creating a, a clear separation. I mean, he is dividing the people with a line. I mean, he's literally drawing a line between people. He, he is seeing in, in black and white. And what we like to do, we like to see various shades of gray. Like, one, we're not sitting here fully convinced that, oh, I'm a sheep. I'm on the right side. I mean, I'm a sheep. But I doubt any of us are like, I am a goat. I mean, I am doomed, right? We're probably somewhere here in the middle. We're probably a five or a six, you know, makes, makes us feel better. You know, I'm not perfect. I've done some good, but, you know, I, I can't do good all the time, right? That's, that's where we have our mindset. We're middle of the rotors. And it's apparent that Jesus does not fall into that. He doesn't, he doesn't believe in this middle area, this gray area. It's black or it's white. You are a sheep or you are a goat. There are wise bridesmaids who brought enough oil, and there are bridesmaids who didn't bring enough oil. You either build your house on the foundation of God, or you build it on sand. You either go through this broad gate that leads to destruction, or you go through this narrow gate. There's not another gate. So there's black and white. He's giving us a clear division here. Sheep or goat. And it's important to, to remember that we are going to be held accountable. We are going to be judged. There will be judgment. We'll have to give an account of how we have lived our lives, how we've used our resources, how we, we respond to God's will. And I'm, I'm one of them, but I'm sure there's a lot of us here that get uncomfortable. I mean, this is, this is convicting stuff, straight to the heart, uncomfortable feeling, because I don't know if I'm a sheep. I, don't, I, don't, I hope I'm not a goat, right? And th this sounds an awful lot like works-based righteousness. So, so you're saying, I have to do all of these things to, to earn favor or to, to be right with God. And, and that's contrary to the scriptures, to the good news, right? But there's a really important thing that we need to, to dive into here. There's a very important piece that needs to be said. When you go back to the verse... Those on the right, he says, come that you are blessed by my father, inherit, inherit the kingdom of God that has been prepared for you. Inheritance, it's, it's a gift. It's something that we didn't earn, right? Inherit the kingdom. And the, and the righteous, they were, they were unaware of this. They, they said, Lord, when, when did we see, when did we do this for you? When did we, we didn't do that. Right? They weren't consciously thinking about what they have to do to earn favor and earn merit with God. It was just something that they did because of their relationship with God. Righteousness, they were right with God because they were in a relationship with God that was producing fruit and producing light, right? But it wasn't something that they 
felt like they had to live by this and this and this and this to make sure you do that because I need to earn favor, okay? And it, it should be something that's natural that is coming out of us. Our actions are a sign of our relationship with God, right? Faith without works is dead, but, but works proves that you have a faith. I mean, where is your fruit, right? You, we will recognize each other by our fruit, right? And so with, with all of this, that gut feeling hasn't left. This is still a very condemn, condemning sermon here. How can we live this out, though? Right? I mean, what's the underlying lesson that Jesus is teaching his disciples? There has to be a catch here. I mean, how can we sleep at night? How can you go home today trusting that you are a sheep and not a goat? Or how can you go home and, and, and be secure or know that you built your foundation on the rock of God and not on sand? How do you know that you've entered through the narrow gate and not the broad gate? How do you know if you have enough oil? Are you prepared enough? How do, you, how do we know that? How can we be secure in that? And, and the answer is it, it's the core message of the Bible. It is the foundation of the Bible. It, it sums up the entire story of the Bible. And I'm going to do something a little different here. Would anyone be bold enough to find a pew Bible or the Bible you brought and look up Matthew 22? verses 37 through 39, and stand up and read it to the congregation. Anyone? Any takers? Just stand right up. So, does anyone want to stand up and read Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39? Look at me. Oh, John Schwanz. Speak it loud. Yep, I'll speak it loud. <laughs> Jesus replied, Lord, Lord, your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on to these two commandments. Thank you, sir. Love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we, our human minds just can't, can't even fathom what kind of love he's, he's telling us to love here. To love him with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our mind. And, and, and understand the context of that scripture in Matthew 22. The context of that scripture is the Pharisees argued all the time over scripture. They would, they would um, debate on, on what it means and, and, and whatnot. And they were debating over what the greatest commandment was. I mean, the first five books of the Bible have 613 rules and commandments. 613. And so they would argue all the time, you know, which, which one of these is important, is the most important? And so, of course, they're always trying to, to catch Jesus off guard and, and, and get him into a, a, a position to, to compromise him, right? And so they bring Jesus into this conversation and they ask him, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus drops this. He says, love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He boiled all of these rules, everything that, that the Jewish people were living by, to one principle. Right? Love. And our neighbor isn't just a person next door. Our, our neighbor is a person that God has placed right in front of us to love. No matter how different, no matter how inconvenient it will be, no matter how unexpected we are asked to love. And, and the love that he is saying here is a love that, that we don't understand as humans. We don't get it. And uh, the, the greatest example of this love is one of the most you know, famous verses or chapters in the Bible, 1 Corinthians Chapter 13, I so want to read it to you. If I speak human or angelic languages, but do not love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. 
If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith that can move mountains, but do not love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not conceited. Does not act improperly. Does not keep a record of wrongdoings. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is the love. And this is the love that the Pharisees had no clue about. They were boastful. They were prideful. They kept record of wrongdoings, right? They were conceited. So the, the Pharisees didn't understand what this love Jesus was telling them about is. And it's not something that we think about. It's not something that we even talk about. It's something that we do. We, we do it. We love people unconditionally. We love with a heart that, that leads these people to the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate symbol of love, and that's the cross, right? Greatest example of love. Love your neighbor. And we can only love our neighbor if we love God. Right? When we love God, when we understand the love that God has for us, then we can love others the way he calls us to love. And there's, I want to tell you about this woman, our neighbor in North Dakota when we moved there. It was, it was December 1st we moved there, um, 2014. And I, I legitimately felt like, like um, um, Abraham, sorry, Abraham, when, he, when God said, go you, just, just leave everything behind and, and go to this land, it was some land. God was like, just go. And I, we left everything behind. We thought we had our, you know, our forever house. We had our church. We had our families here. And we just left. And we left very fast. We were ready to get out. And so we left. And we got to North Dakota, and it was rough. It was, it, it was, it was not easy. And um, the job wasn't the job it was supposed to be. The, the, the promise of what it was wasn't kept. Um, and we were just miserable there. And this neighbor across the street who would, um, who would brush water off her driveway when the snow melted. I don't know why. Um, I have another funny, really funny fact later in the story. You, I hope you guys laugh. Um, but Brenda, she, we didn't initiate anything. I mean, it was winter, so you're not going outside anyway. Um, and we didn't know anyone. We didn't go to church. We, we, it was hard to even think about that. Um, and so we kind of kept, kept to, to, or to ourselves. We were there um, for a few weeks. And Brenda, right away, she would walk across the street and she would knock on our door. I mean, it would be like 9 o'clock at night. She would stop over and she would just check in. One night she brought over this, this platter of food. And, and, and again, times were, were, were rough for us. I mean, we left everything behind. We put all of our eggs into the, to the, the basket to get to North Dakota, and it was rough. And so she brought over this platter of food. She was like, you know what? My church has dinners once a week, and we had all this extra, and I thought of you guys because you have a new baby. You know, here, here is all this food. It was like, whoa. <laughs> I'm like, thank you so much. I mean, what do you say to that? And she, would, and she would stop by and give a gift for our daughter. And um, it was just crazy. I mean, it was crazy. And the ultimate kicker, it was Christmas. It was our first Christmas away from our families. Um, you know, we're just sitting inside. You didn't have anyone to spend Christmas with. And she stopped over. She was like, I want you to spend Christmas at my house with my family. I'm like, okay, this is Amazing. I mean, I've never spent Christmas with anyone else in my life outside of my family, which is probably why I am the way I am. Um, but it was, it was amazing. I'm like, this is, she doesn't even really know us. We've been here for three and a half weeks. But she gave us a very fair warning. We didn't believe it, but she gave us a fair warning. She's like, you know, just, just come on over. But I, I will say my husband doesn't like to wear pants. <laughs> I... <laughs> 
And then I just saw a vision. This is me in like 30 years. I'm like, I don't like to wear pants either. But so we show up to Christmas dinner, you know, new, new folks in town, first Christmas outside of our family, just going out on a limb, going over to the neighbor's house, and he's in his box of briefs <laughs> at dinner, eating Christmas dinner in his box of briefs. Whew. And then I just, I'm like, that's going to be me. I'm like, what a great way to embarrass the future boyfriends of my daughters. Just come on over for dinner. I'll be in my underwear. Um, and so, I mean, what, what a, is there a, any better example of loving your neighbor? I mean, I honestly, at that point in my life, I didn't even grasp what that meant. And she was just pouring love, pouring love. I didn't ask for it. Sometimes I'd be like, I'd be in my underwear at 9 o'clock and the door is, is knocked and I got to go run and find some shorts and our house would be a mess and all these things. And she, was, she, just, she just wanted to stop in. She cared. A loving neighbor. I'm like, this is crazy. Love your neighbor. And by, and by loving God, this is what Jesus is saying. This, this is summing up everything that he is preaching. This is what he came for, right? Love God. Love me. Love Jesus. Love God and love your neighbor. And every one of these rules are fulfilled. If you love God and you love your neighbor, you don't have to worry about if you're a sheep or a goat. Or if you're going into the right gate, or if you have enough oil. You don't have to worry about that. You follow these two commandments. Love me and love your neighbor. It's all. Anytime you reach out to someone, you help someone, help out God's children who are created in his image. When you serve and minister to people, you are serving and ministering to Jesus himself. He says it. And when you don't do that, you aren't serving Jesus, right? And so I want to end with this one story. Um, this man named Martin of Tours. He was a Roman soldier and a Christian. One cold day, he was entering a city, and a beggar stopped him and asked for alms. Martin had no money, but the beggar was blue, and he was shivering in the cold. And Martin gave him what he had. So he took off his soldier's coat. It was worn out. It was frayed. And he cut it into two, and he gave the beggar the other half. And so he went home, and that night he had a dream and in the dream, he saw the heavenly places and all these angels, and Jesus was standing in the midst of these angels. And one of the angels said, Master, why are you wearing that battered old cloak? Who gave it to you? And Jesus said softly, My servant Martin gave it to me. Consider this, this question today. What might Jesus say we have given to him. Right? What might Jesus say you have given to him?